Al, I think I see mostly familiar faces. I chair the forum. Uh, I'm really happy to be here and happy to have you here for the first event of our final season, our 18th and final season. And tonight, I'm not sure I've got the count exactly right, but I believe tonight is the 100th event since we launched the forum in 2001. And, and I, I am so grateful to all the people who worked with me through the years to make this happen. Uh, the succession of people who have served on the board with me to organize it, the people who are doing it now, and the people who have donated through the years to keep it going. We've done all this with community support. Uh, I think we had one grant from the human, uh, from the, not the human rights, the Gloucester Arts Council or the Cape Ann Arts Council for web development. Other than that, it's all been your donations that have brought people here to speak from uh, all over the country and sometimes beyond. Um, and I'm, I'm really pleased that we've done it. I think that we're coming to the end of our energy level here. I need to leave to write a book. And we're going to wrap up with a bang, uh, with a great final season and a celebration at the end, which we'll tell you more about as we go. Um, I'm very pleased tonight that we have foreign policy analyst, uh, editor, playwright, actor, and novelist John Pfeffer from Washington, who flew up today for the second time to speak at the forum. Uh, some of you may remember he was here talking about the growth of uh, far-right extremism in the world uh, back in 2016. And he's here tonight to update that, uh, that issue uh, and talk about the challenges they pose for the future. The next event we have will be November 18th, uh, also a Sunday, of course, right here, same time, same, same place, with uh, author and historian Nancy McLean on the threat posed by another wing of the, uh, the global uh, right, whose goal for the past 70 years has been to dismantle the public sector and get government out of all economic and social programs, which is the subject of her latest book, Democracy in Chains. And we'll end our run as the Cape Ann Forum uh, in early May with a uh, New Yorker, essayist, poet, uh, and author, Eliza Griswold on the issues raised in her latest book about the impact of fracking on a family living in western Pennsylvania and the degradation of the global environment, after which we will party. Um, I think we may end up moving that forum up from the time slot that we usually start at so that we can do some things afterward, um, but I'll have to let you know about that as we go along. Uh, if you're not on our mailing list, you will not know where or when. So take this opportunity, if you haven't done it, to sign up at the back uh, for email or snail mail. Um, we got good coverage this week, as some of you may have noticed, in the Gloucester Daily Times and also in the Cape Ann Beacon. Uh, good morning, Gloucester. Did not post it because they thought it was too political. Um, the, it may be. Um, but the most reliable way to find out about us is through email or snail mail. We're going to send postcards out before the next two events. So uh, if you put your name down now, you will get mail, and then the list will uh, be held after that. We're not selling it or giving it away, so you're not going to get barraged by people with other axes to grind. Uh, let's see. If you've been to forums, you know that this is when I lean on you and say, we need money. But tonight, I'm going to moderate that. We need a little bit of money. We are spending down the reserves that we built up over the years to make sure that we could keep this going uh, so that we're going to get as near to zero and hopefully not quite there at the end of the year. Uh, so, but we still need some because we're coming up short. We've got three people coming from out of town. Uh, we've got transportation costs uh, and, and other costs going behind every forum. If there's any money left over, it's going to go into the fund that we've been building up to keep the uh, annual uh, International Awareness Award for a graduating Gloucester High School senior 
uh, going. Uh, we're going to transfer that over to the high school so that it will continue for years to come uh, as both recognition for and an investment in uh, the next generation of social activists. Um, I am particularly happy to say that we have with us this evening uh, the recipient of last year's uh, honor, Carolyn Enos, who has started school uh, in Boston, but came back to Gloucester tonight to tell us a little bit about a research project we asked her to carry out on the, uh, the impact that the award has had on uh, previous recipients and kind of what they're doing now. Uh, so I'm going to first start with Carolyn, who is over here. Carolyn, can I give you a few minutes with the microphone? Hi, so can you hear me? Okay, so hi, like you said, I'm Caroline Enos. I'm a journalism and government major, government major at Suffolk University in Boston. Um, and to, like Dan said, we did this project to see where the recipients are now, what they're doing, what their goals are, and I have a bit of a report to say um, about where they're standing in life right now. So again, the, the purpose of the award was to see what prior awardees are doing and the impact of the award on their education and careers are. So in order to find the awardees throughout the month of August this year, I gathered in contact information on Facebook and LinkedIn and interviewed awardees via email, Facebook, or phone call. We had about a 60% response rate. Um, there's still one person who's trying to send me their response, but um, overall we have a good representation of who received the award. Um, we have representation from people who, the very first recipients of the award up to me. <laughs> um, so when asked what they're doing today, basically, um, those who answered said that they study journalism, social work, international relations, public policy and government, or something in the medical or science field in college. They said that even if they do not work in a field related to social justice, all of them have been part of social justice demonstrations, organizations, or clubs beyond high school. This includes responding to issues surrounding refugees, LGBT individuals, domestic violence victims, children of low-income families, terminally ill children, healthy relationships, and sustainability. The, those who responded said that they had studied abroad in Israel, um, Ireland, and all over the world, really. Um, some of them have worked as biological science technicians for National Park Service, uh, full-time swim coaches at YMCA. They've been travel directors. They've worked for mentor partnerships. And they've worked for National Refugee Services and activist organizations. So all the recipients who received the award were women, and when asked what they thought about why it might be that way, uh, many re recipients agree that people who gravitate towards wanting change in the world are people that have experienced the inequality built into the institution. There are many strong female role models for students to look up to at GHS, and they think that that's partly why it was all females. Um, they also said that girls mature faster than boys, partially due to social conditioning, and also noted that thinking beyond one's immediate world is a sign of maturity. They said that at GHS, AP, Honors, and NHS students were mostly female. They noted that this had to do with social maturity, as boys were not often put in advanced classes because of a lack of social maturity and lost the opportunity to develop, <laughs> this is them, <laughs> um, and lost the opportunity to develop types of critical thinking needed for global awareness as a result. And I can kind of say I saw that as well. Um, even if the boys in my classes were as intelligent to kind of, oh, sorry, yeah. Um, so, oh, sure. Um, so basically, in our classes, boys were often kept behind because they were too loud. That's, I guess, what they were trying to get at. <laughs> um, they also said that there was less social pressure on female students to do sports. Therefore, there were more time for them to do clubs, such as Human Rights Club and other clubs like that. They also said that boys are too busy with sports to have time for clubs. They said there aren't enough male role models encouraging civic engagement, not necessarily at the high school level, but kind of in a broader spectrum, I guess. Um, and they said that outlets for male creativity and energy are more escapist, so when they play video games, that takes up a lot of their free time. Again, this is very general, <laughs> what they said. Um, and they also said that women are more community-minded than men. And I don't think any of them mean, meant that in a negative way. They just, what they saw. Um, so when asked when there, were there enough opportunities at Gloucester High for involvement in international issues, 
they said that older recipients um, thought that classes or classwork in international affairs could have been stronger. However, newer recipients thought that GHS was proficient in this area. Most noted that their involvement in the Human Rights Initiative, or formerly known by Amnesty International, or the Environmental Club sparked their interest in social justice or global affairs. Recent graduates noted that the Human Rights Initiative, previously named Amnesty International, had low engagement numbers. Um, they said that GHS had a decent offering for ways to get involved in global issues, but there was a lack of interest from the student body. And this has kind of changed since I've been there. Um, I think the political spectrum right now or the political scene is very polarizing. That's kind of energized a lot of my peers. So that's kind of changed, I think, in my perspective. Um, they also noted that there was not much, uh, not much support from male students at GHS due to the school's focus on sports. One of the quotes from one of the recipients was that, High schools are very much authoritarian. Human rights issues often stem from people being punished for not following unjust rules. Therefore, the mindset of being a good high schooler and that of being socially, a socially active citizen of the world are very different. When asked how to improve international awareness at GHS, they suggested that a global or, or local service learning component should be required for graduation. They also said that GHS should offer to promote student involvement and pre-approved internationally based organizations, kind of like Amnesty International, other organizations like that. And then more recent graduates, including myself, suggested that they bring back Model UN or Debate Club. And then finally, when asked what the impact of the scholarship had on them, they, all of them said that the scholarship helped fund recipients' tuition for their first semester or buying books. The recipients were most grateful that the award funded their education and in turn, the opportunities they were given to continue their social justice work. They also said that the award encouraged them to continue working in social justice, such as joining social justice clubs in college, taking classes that are more globally minded or that align with the Cape Ann Forum's interests, and help them to consider to study or work abroad. Overall, the award affir affirmed the awardee's shared value of being involved in issues beyond their own sphere, and encouraged them to continue to foster a more global mindset among their peers and communities. To end with a quote from, a from 2016 recipient Kara Stockman, she said, I truly believe that the Cape Ann Forum's generous award motivated me to pursue my interest in international territory. My trip to Iceland to study alternative energy my freshman year was the platform I needed to attack a looming environmental problem at my school. The thought of contacting the higher-ups terrified me, but I reminded myself that I left the Cape Ann Forum with promises to keep tackling global issues. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So thanks to Carolyn for that presentation, and thanks to all of you for enabling this and for supporting it. Um, now let's move on to the event for the evening. Are there any other announcements of community events that you want people to know about, apart from the play that's now going on at the Gloucester Stage Company that everybody should go to? Um, Okay, John Pfeffer, I, how many people were here for John's talk in 2016? Okay, um, many. If you're not familiar with his work, uh, John Pfeffer is the Director of Foreign Policy and Focus. Uh, it's it self-described as a think tank without walls. It's a web-based uh, news service uh, for which John frequently posts analyses uh, of events and trends, um, and which I urge you to visit. It's really easy to find. It's fpif.org, easy to remember. He's also written for a wide range of other media on the issues he's talking about this evening, and in his spare time, he's produced four nonfiction books, three novels, and six plays. <laughs> One of the novels, uh, Splinterlands, is for sale in the back. Uh, a sequel to that, uh, or related story, Frostlands, is coming out in about three weeks. We'd hoped we'd have it here, but it isn't uh, yet ready. Uh, he's got another nonfiction book in the back as well. They will be for sale and signing at the end of the forum. Uh, I want to say something now, and I'll say it again later. Uh, please don't crowd the table while he's doing this. He hand carried the books up here, so give him a chance to get his work out to the broader public. Uh, for your information, he will be able to take credit cards or cash. 
The books are 10 or $20, so it's easy. Please welcome John Pfeffer. So, it's a great honor to be here in your final season. Thank you, Dan, for the very nice introduction. I'm going to walk around because I'm cold, and you're cold too, it looks like. I have an extra sweater in the back, so if anybody needs a sweater, it's just in my suitcase. Um, for those of you who were here a couple of years ago, you might remember that uh, the topic was very similar, and it was before the elections. It was before the U.S. presidential elections. And I said, I said to you all that the 2016 election I didn't think was the most important election. I thought the 2020 election was going to be the most important election because I said I didn't think that Donald Trump is going to win. I thought, I know, I was wrong. I thought <laughs> that... A, a much more, a much slicker, much more professional, more uh, sophisticated right wing, radical right wing candidate would emerge, especially after four years of Hillary Clinton. Okay, so I was half right. I was wrong about 2016, obviously, along with a lot of other people, but I think I'm right about 2020. Well, it might be Donald Trump again. We don't know. Or it could be Nikki Haley. Could be Mike Pence. Or it could be my favorite, Tom Cotton, who is a senator from Arkansas. And he, is, he has all of Trump's views, but he is he is the slickest politician you will ever find in the Republican Party. This is my fear of what's going to happen in 2020. Question tonight is, has the alt-right peaked? Have we kind of, with the election of Trump, kind of seen the worst of the damage, the worst of the hurricane coming at us? Well, first question to ask is, has there been a Trump effect? In other words, has the election of Donald Trump inspired other people around the world to say, I'm running for office just like Donald Trump did with his same views, with the same kind of outsider mentality, using the same kind of social media approach? Well, let's look at a poll from 2018. June 2018, it's a Pew poll. It looked at how people around the world look at Trump and the presidency. Well, in 2016, 64% looked favorably at the American president around the world, 64%. 2018, June, that number was 22. <laughs> it's the most dramatic drop, perhaps, that few has ever seen in American, or um, rather, global public opinion about the American presidency. One of the kind of graphic examples of how the world looks at Trump happened just recently at the UN when Donald Trump was talking about his accomplishments and... Yes, okay, well, when was the last time people laughed at Donald Trump? Uh, 2011, correspondence dinner. You remember that. That was when Barack Obama was giving a presentation, and he was very funny, and a lot of it poked fun at Donald Trump. A lot of people said that's when Donald Trump decided to run for president. So the consequences of laugh laughing at Donald Trump, <clears throat> I don't want to go into those, but we already know, you know the kind of revenge the U.S. is planning through the U.N. for nations that flout U.S. authority. Okay, so that's, that would suggest, however, that there is no Trump effect, that Trump's low popularity around the world has not inspired really anybody to follow his example. So that's the good news. The bad news is it actually doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what people around the world think of Donald Trump personally or him as president. 
And let me give you the most recent example, and that is Brazil. Brazil, in a recent poll on what they think of Donald Trump, the number was even lower than the global average of 22%. It was 14%. 14% of Brazilians think that Donald Trump has done a good job as American president. And yet, in the most recent election, 46%, this is the first round of the Brazilian presidential election, 46% voted for Jair Bolsonaro, who has described himself as the Donald Trump of Brazil, the so-called Trump of the tropics. This is the first round. He didn't get to 50%. 50% is what's necessary, so there will be a second round. Yes, maybe all of the opposition will come together, just as in France the opposition came together in support of Macron against Marine Le Pen. Maybe that will happen in Brazil, but I wouldn't count on it. So here we have an example of it doesn't actually matter about Trump himself, but his views or what he represents politically, I think, is still growing around the world. We have not hit the high point yet. What other examples do we have? Italy, where the far-right Northern League is now in government. Austria, where the far-right Freedom Party is now in government. Eastern Europe, Andrei Babish in Czech Republic. Again, a businessman who's described himself as the Trump of the Czech Republic one. Bulgaria, where even further far-right parties are participating in the government. Throughout Eastern Europe, of course, we already had in Poland and in Hungary right-wing populist parties in control. Germany, Sweden, the far-right parties there are now the third largest parties. Okay, Germany, yes, there's been, of course, as we all know, a history of far-right parties. Sweden? Sweden? I mean, like my whole life, Sweden's been socialist. And now they're number three, the so-called Democratic Party. Of course, it's beyond Europe. The far-right is mobilizing worldwide. Japan. Shinzo Abe has been in power for some time. In fact, if he remains in power until 2019, he will be the longest serving Japanese prime minister in modern Japanese history. Far right wing nationalist politician. Right wing authoritarian anti liberal governments in Russia, in India, in Turkey, in Colombia, all over the world. Even in countries where they, the politicians were kind of on the left. Daniel Ortega, Sandinista. But if you just look at the politics of the Nicaraguan government, he looks like a right-wing authoritarian to me. Philippines, Rodrigo Duterte, also in some sense coming sort of from the left. But he too, right-wing populist authoritarian. Now, this is all to suggest that this is not peaking even yet. Okay, yes, you may be asking yourself, well, aren't there any, isn't there any good news? Yes, of course, there's good news. Mexico, South Korea, Moon Jae-in, New Zealand, Iceland, Portugal, but these are like outposts compared to the wave of right-wing nationalism that's spreading. Now the question is, why? If it's not Trump, if it's not the Trump effect, why? Why is this happening? And why is it happening now? I mean, in the presentation I gave two years ago, I talked about a backlash against liberalism, an economic, political, and cultural backlash. I don't want to repeat myself, even for people who weren't here two years ago, so I'm going to try to take that material and fold it in a different way. But I want to begin by talking about a book that recently came out, and it's a bestseller by Craig Unger, about the connections between Trump and Russia. I want to start there because of one small paragraph in that book. 
about Hungary and where Craig Unger got it wrong. And I think it's illustrative. In this book, Craig Unger says that Viktor Orban, Viktor Orban is the head of the Fidesz party. He's been prime minister in Hungary since 2010. He used to be a liberal and then he moved all the way over to the right-hand side of the political spectrum because he saw an opportunity there. Now, Craig Unger says that in 1994, a bag man from the Putin government delivered money secretly to Orban. They videotaped it. And as a result, Orban switched his position. Now, remember, this is Hungary. Hungary, 1956, Soviet Union invades Hungary. Viktor Orban makes a name for himself politically at the end of the 1980s by railing against the presence of Soviet troops. To put it lightly, Russia is not really popular in Hungary. So for someone like Viktor Orban to switch over from an anti-Russian point of view to a pro-Russian point of view, that's a pretty big thing in Hungary. Craig Unger says it's because he got some money and they have damaging material about him that they could release unless he supports Putin. And let me tell you, that's nonsense. That is, I can't believe that a best-selling book by a responsible journalist would make this claim. Okay, maybe he got money. I really doubt it, though. There's one source for this, a former German bank robber. <laughs> one source, and it's a bank robber? Nah. Also, actually, Orban was prime minister before he became prime minister in 2010. He was prime minister from 1998 to 2002. What happened in 1999? Hungary joined NATO. Uh, not exactly a pro-Russian move on the part of Orban, the supposedly pro-Russian prime minister. Now, this story, frankly, doesn't explain why Orban changed his position. It had nothing to do with money. Okay, ordinarily as a journalist, yes, I believe strongly in the principle of follow the money, okay? If you follow the money, you can discover a lot about why the motivations. Why did Donald Trump change his position on Israel-Palestine, for instance? Well, you know, when he was a candidate, he said, oh, I'll look at both sides. I'm not going to be beholden to the Israel lobby. And then Sheldon Adelson, the casino magnate, provided him with tens of millions of dollars. And whoops, he changed his position. Okay, follow the money. That does explain that particular move. But it has nothing to do with why Viktor Orban changed his position to become pro-Russian. Why he did that is for ideological reasons. There are ideological reasons why Viktor Orban said, I like Russia. I like what Putin is doing. Putin is forming an anti-liberal axis, and I, here in Hungary, I, Viktor Orban, also want to be part of that anti-liberal axis. Ideology. Ideology suggests two things. One, that ideas matter, and two, power. It's about power. Now, I would also argue that the reason Donald Trump is a right-wing radical Republican now instead of the Democrat he sort of was when he was in New York and hanging out at you know, discos and stuff, that also has more to do with ideology, with ideas, not his, but the ones he's borrowed, and power, his desire for it, not money. Not money. So to explain why the radical right is in power throughout the world, I think, has less to do with money than it does with ideas and power associated with those ideas. Now, to understand that, I want to take what I talked about two years ago, the economic, the political, and the cultural, and explain it with respect to Putin. So why did Orban switch his allegiance to Russia. What was it about Russia that was so attractive to him? Well, as I said, Putin is 
eager to create a new kind of axis, an anti-liberal axis. But what does it mean, anti-liberal? In order to understand that, I have to just take a moment to explain what liberal means in this context. There are three aspects to liberalism. There's the two that we're familiar with in terms of American liberalism, that is political liberalism, in other words, checks and balances, uh, you know, the kind of democratic practice, ideally at least, that we have here in the United States. Um, culturally, kind of liberalism that we associate with a lot of social movements and the successes of social movements over the years. Uh, so expansion of franchise for vote, voting, human rights issues, et cetera. So those are the kind of familiar things for liberalism here in the United States. Economic is the challenge here, because economic liberalism here in the United States generally means government intervention in the economy, right? Social security, national health care. It's when the government intervenes into the economy for the public good. That's what we associate with liberalism here in the United States, legacy of FDR, et cetera. But liberalism globally, on economically, means the opposite. It means taking the government out of the economy, reducing government role in the economy. So when I talk about what Putin is trying to create, his anti-liberalism, it's that kind of liberalism, the two from the United States that we're familiar with, political and cultural, and then this more global understanding of economic liberalism, which is anti-government. What Putin is trying to do economically is against that form of liberalism. In other words, he wants the government to be involved. He wants his government to be involved in the economy. He wants he, him and his crew, his cronies, to be controlling as much of the Russian, government, Russian economy as possible. Oil interests, natural gas, strategic resources, all of that in his control. Not in the control of market forces, not in control of foreign corporations. His control. Okay, that's number one. Number two, politically, he's not interested in checks and balances. He's not interested in any kind of impediment to his control of power. Culturally, very conservative vision. Religious, anti-immigrant, xenophobic, homophobic, misogynist, traditional Russian values. So this is the anti-liberalism of Vladimir Putin for Russia, but not just Russia. Putin wants as much as possible to create, recreate Europe in that image. Not the image that the European Union offers, not the image of the Swedish socialists, not the German social democrats, no. A nationalist, reactionary Europe. So this is what I mean when I talk about the, the three backlashes against liberalism. Now, this is not new. So when I'm talking about this alt-right reactionary rejection of liberalism in its three forms, what we're seeing with Trump, what we're seeing with Bolsonaro in Brazil, what we're seeing with Austria, Italy. This is nothing new. To understand it, we have to go back first to Eastern Europe in the early 1990s. I'm not going to go into this in too much detail because, of course, it's all in my book in the back if you want to buy that. Um, suffice it to say that Eastern Europe in the early 1990s went through a kind of industrial strength liberalism or liberalization, liberalization of the economy, 
liberalization of culture, liberalization of politics. Coming out of the communist era, all of these countries very quickly, very powerfully adopted liberal institutions. But what that meant was there was an immediate backlash. People said, look, this is not, this is not helping us. In Poland, unemployment rate went up into the t above 30% at one point. Politicians were involved in all sorts of scandals, privatization scams. People said they're corrupt. We don't want these liberal politicians. And they're very conservative countries. And they were not, many people were not happy with the emergence of LGBT movement, the rise of feminism, or re-rise of feminism, modern forms of fem feminism. So a backlash. And a backlash that initially was dismissed as just an exception. So for instance, in the presidential election in Poland in 1990, there was a guy named Stan Tominski. You've never heard of him for good reason. He lost. But he was just like Trump, exactly like Trump. He was crazy. He was an outsider. He was a businessman. He was running against two very traditional candidates, Lech Wałęsa, Nobel Prize winner, Mazowiecki, long-term, long-time politician. People said, Tominski is crazy. There's no way he's going to win. He got far, though. He got into the second round. And people said, well, this is just an exception. We're not going to see Tominski's again. But then, in the, after the division of Czechoslovakia, Czech Republic and Slovakia, Vladimir Mechiar emerges. Vladimir, Me Vladimir Mechiar, just like a Trump character. Power hungry, corrupt, media savvy. They finally got rid of him after four years. And again, people said, well, this is just an exception. You know, they made a detour. Slovakia made a little detour. But the real road is liberalism. And we're on it finally. What people didn't realize is Tominski and Mechiar were not the exceptions. Tominski and Mechiar were a vision of what was to come, what was going to become dominant politics in Eastern Europe, not the exception. And Viktor Orban, the Prime Minister of Hungary, he saw that. He saw what was happening and he said, I know which way the wind is blowing. And if I'm going to win, I can't stay with a liberal party. I have to create an anti-liberal party. But it's not just Eastern Europe. I mean, in order to understand what's happening now, we actually have to go further back in time. Because we've seen anti-liberal waves in the past. The interwar period between World War I and World War II. A backlash against liberal politics increasingly in Europe and in the United States. Charles Lindbergh, Father Coughlin. Or further back than that, turn of the century, backlash against globalization. At the time, 1914, before World War I, the world was more globalized than ever before in terms of the economy, in terms of communication, in terms of transportation. In fact, after World War I, the world did not become as globalized as it was in 1913 until the 1950s. And there was a backlash against liberalism at that time as well. But I would go back even further, before there was even the concept of liberalism. In order to understand what we're going through right now, I think we have to go back to the early 16th century. I think we have to go back to Martin Luther. Because what we're talking about, what we're looking at, are a group of people around the world who don't want reform. They want a reformation. And what do I mean by a reformation? I mean the same thing that Martin Luther meant by reformation. Martin Luther looked around and he said, I don't like those globalists in Rome, those people who want to control the world and control us, speak the same language, Latin. All have the same religion, Catholic. I don't like those globalists. And I certainly don't like their economy, their indulgences, 
corrupt economic practices that make no sense. Oh, and I don't really like the politicians, the political elite of that time, who are all compromised by their connections to Rome. And I don't like the culture of the Catholic Church either. It's too permissive. You're thinking, permissive? The Catholic Church? 16th century? Well, if you read your Chaucer, you know exactly what I mean by permissive. The nun's tale? Whoa, what's going on in those convents? Whew. Well, Martin Luther didn't like that either. Oh, and he also didn't like minorities very much, specifically Jews. So he had a kind of xenophobic reaction as well. And oh, by the way, he was also committed to a nationalist vision. He wanted the Bible to be in German so people could read it. Oh, and also, he really liked Twitter. <laughs> I accept it wasn't Twitter. At that time, it was known as the printing press, which had been invented in the 15th century. Well, in Germany, it had been invented in the 15th century. Protestants and Martin Luther used that new technology unbelievably in their spread of their ideas. Now, I don't think Donald Trump is a Martin Luther figure, okay? So let's get that out there right now. I do think, however, there are other people in this alt-right revolution who have a similar kind of vision, a global vision of an ideological transformation. Steve Bannon. Okay, Steve Bannon happens to be Catholic, but that aside, Steve Bannon as the architect of the alt-right revolution, I think is very clear about the global transformation. He has been visiting, as you probably know, Europe in order to consolidate a European alt-right movement. All the groups that I talked about at the top, the ones that have been successful, all of them have the uh, fingerprints of Steve Bannon over them. He's even been to Japan. He has a truly global perspective. And of course, if you're going to have a liberal ax, uh, an anti-liberal axis, as Steve Bannon wants to create, you have to have a counter-axis, another group that you're up against. Yes, he's up against the globalists. He's up against the liberals. But he's also up against what he calls the kind of, what I guess Bannon would call his axis of evil. And that would be China, Iran, and Turkey. Those are the kind of three key countries. Turkey. Turkey because Turkey represents uh, the threat of Islam, particularly to Europe. Now, if we use the Protestant Reformation as an example, and you know, all analogies are insufficient, so I'm sure you're coming, you're thinking, well, you know, what about this, what about that? We use them only to help us think through a problem. So if we use the Protestant Reformation to help us as an analogy, what does that tell us about the future? Well, number one, there are gonna be schisms. Protestantism almost immediately split apart into various denominations. And you will see the alt-right has already split has, there's no cohesion, really. I mean, for instance, on the, the issue of Turkey. Like I said, Steve Bannon doesn't like Turkey. Viktor Orban in Hungary, he loves Turkey. He's been working very hard to increase trade relations with the country because he wants to break the control or, of Brussels. Viktor Orban is using Turkey as leverage. He wants to cover his bets. So there's that. There, or, for instance, on the question of religion. Duterte in the Philippines, he's built his, his power base in, in some ways anti-Catholic, going up against the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church has opposed, not surprisingly, his extrajudicial killings. Thousands and thousands of suspected drug dealers that the Duterte government has simply killed. And the Catholic Church has stepped forward and said, this is unacceptable. So Duterte has declared effectively, has declared war against the Catholic Church. But 
In other countries, religion plays an extremely important role in the alt-right, far-right movement. So there are lots of different perspectives in the alt-right. In other words, to imagine that all of these groups are going to come together in a kind of nationalist international, well, I mean, just that phrase, nationalist international, does that make any sense? No, nationalists, generally speaking, are not going to come together and form a tight union. They will work together, of course, on issue-by-issue issue basis, as the nationalists in Europe are doing. But to imagine them all working together in some kind of um, international is unlikely. So that's one thing, schisms. Second thing, Catholic Church, of course, after the Reformation, involved itself in a variety of different reforms. I mean, do we have indulgences today? Does the Catholic Church in Rome sell indulgences? No. Uh, there have been a wave of reforms, obviously, if you're Catholic, you might think not enough, too much, Vatican II, lots of different reforms in the Catholic Church. So similarly, this, this layer of globalism, international financial institutions, the EU, um, the OECD, the group of, of seven, I mean, all of these kind of globalist institutions, they too will reform as the Catholic Church reformed under pressure from this threat. So for instance, uh, you might have read, not I mean, a couple years ago, Christian Lagarde, the IMF, said, you know, we have to take a, a, a strong look at this economic model that we've been insisting on for several decades. Finally, the IMF realizes that these austerity measures that it's insisting countries follow, again, liberal in the global sense, cutting back on government involvement in the economy, they're not working and they're producing an enormous backlash and a backlash that the right wing is taking advantage of. So the IMF, World Bank, rethinking some of these, obviously in my opinion not deeply enough, but again, reform at that level. And then third, civilizational conflict. Obviously the Reformation ushered in a period of war, war between Protestant and Catholic. It's lasted hundreds of years. I don't actually think that Samuel Huntington and his thesis of a clash of civilizations was correct when it came out in the 1990s. Many of the civiliza civilizational conflicts that he perceived were actually clashes within a civilization. So for instance, within Islam between Shia and Sunni. However, I do think that there are people like Steve Bannon and others who are promoting civilizational conflict. They would like to see the United States and Saudi Arabia and Israel team up against Iran, for instance, in a civilizational conflict. So yes, as I said, I don't, I don't see the alt-right joining hands globally in some kind of ideological framework, but I do see them engaging in what will be civilizational conflicts, unfortunately. Now, All of which is to say, and I'm going to wrap up in the next five minutes. <laughs> All of which is to say, this is no blip. What's happening today, the victories of Trump, Bolsonaro, Northern League. Oh, I forgot one other thing. Oh, I really wanted to add this one. France. France. You remember the election. Marine Le Pen and the National Front, they got totally wiped out in the presidential elections by Macron, this new party. And people were like, that's the end of the National Front. Forget it. Marine Le Pen, she noticed her popularity dropped. The, the party did very poorly in the election. That's the end of, of the National Front. Recent polls, National Front is number two party. Half a percent, half a percent behind Macron's party. So anyway, this is no blip. These successful groups, these successful parties, 
And why do I say that it's not a blip? Putin has been in power since 1999. Erdogan in Turkey has been in power since 2003. We have had Viktor Orban in power in Hungary since 2010. And Abe, as I said, has been in power since 2012 and will likely be the longest serving Japanese prime minister. These are long serving politicians and their movements have deep roots. What will happen here in the United States? I started out by saying I had great fears for the 2020 election. We have seen, and your next speaker will address kind of the democratic questions of governance related to the Trump revolution, I suspect, but we've seen the Trump administration consolidate its power through the courts, and not just the Supreme Court, but all the federal courts, pushing through judicial appointments as quickly as possible, a, a wish list provided by the Federalist Society, a, a right-wing uh, judicial movement. It has done what it can at the executive level, Trump doing whatever he can through executive orders to uh, impose his will, as well as to try to increase the power of the executive in general. And then, of course, congressionally speaking, in various attempts at voter suppression, gerrymandering, to maintain some Republican majority, if not in the House, then at least remaining in the Senate. For me, this is very troubling because it suggests not only institutional consolidation, of the Trump platform, but an attempt to basically warp the rules, the electoral rules, to ensure a kind of Republican hegemony, a minority hegemony at that, for years to come. And that raises three questions that I throw out to you. Is liberalism a blip in the long term? I mean, you remember Francis Fukuyama published his, his The End of History essay in 1989, and Fukuyama said, liberalism is going to be the future. Okay, there'll be some little arguments here, disagreements there, but basically, from now on, what we're gonna get is some version around the world of the European Union bureaucracy. The future is going to be dull, dull, dull. That was his prediction. Of course, it was immediately proven wrong by the collapse of Yugoslavia, but nevertheless, there was this expectation that the kind of liberalism that was present in the United States, in Europe, and in many other countries around the world coming out of the Cold War period would simply be the status quo forever. Okay, there might be, again, some deviations here and there. A Mechiar in Slovakia, for instance, but the road was clear. But now the question becomes, maybe that is completely wrong. Not just a little wrong, but completely wrong. And the liberal order that we've become so accustomed to, that is basically deeply baked into our society here, regardless of whether it's a Democrat or Republican in charge in Washington, that that is the blip. That that will come to an end. And this alt-right perspective, ideology, anti-liberal perspective will become the new status quo. So that's one question. Second question, of course, you can have different kinds of anti-liberal responses. The alt-right provides one critique of liberalism, but there are other critiques of liberalism. I critique liberalism all, all the time. Honestly, there was a lot about the Trump agenda that I found compelling. I know, that sounds kind of weird, but let me explain. Number one, I hate Washington. I live there, but whatever. I hate Washington. I hate how arrogant it is. I hate how corrupt it is. I, too, would love to see a transformation of American political culture. From the left, of course, not from the right. Number two, I, too, believe that 
the economy has shafted people here in the United States. Working people have been left behind. There's been lots of obvious economic progress, but it has not, quote unquote, trickled down. A lot of people left behind. And we have to address that. We have to change the economy. Again, I look at it from a left perspective, not a right perspective, but I too have a critique of liberalism. So the question for me is, is there going to be that kind of alternative that is popular? I mean, it exists, but will it be popular enough, either here or Europe or elsewhere? And then the final question is, what about climate change? I mean, climate change is a problem that we have to solve internationally. It's not something we can solve here by ourselves in Gloucester. It's not something we can solve by ourselves in Massachusetts. It's not something we can solve just in the United States. It requires an international response, and a response that is totally lacking from the alt-right perspective. So what are, where does this leave us in dealing with the most pressing issue of our time? When I was here, and I'll finish on this. When I was here two years ago, I just finished this novel, Splinterlands, which is <coughs> on sale on the back table. Um, and the reason I wrote it was because, again, I was worried about 2020. I wasn't so, as much worried about 2016. But I, and I was worried about the global trends, Brexit, growing nationalism throughout the world, and so I wrote what I felt was the worst case scenario. What would happen in 2050 if everything continues along those lines? If the world basically splits apart into fragments? And then came the 2016 elections, and people were like, how did you know this was going to happen? I said, well, uh, <laughs> I didn't actually predict this, but..." I can see how reading this book you might think that that's what I thought was going to happen. In the book, for instance, there's a Hurricane Donald that comes in and inundates Washington, D.C. in floods. But again, I thought that was going to happen in 2020. Now, I'm publishing the sequel, Frostlands, and it addresses this question of climate change. It's a little bit more hopeful, a little bit more hopeful, I wish that the Cape Ann Forum were to continue because, for, for just egocentric reasons, <laughs> selfish reasons, because there's a third volume in the book. It's going to come out in two years. And it's the optimistic one. And I hate to just leave you with two dystopian books because I do think there is something hopeful out there. And I wish I could come back in two years to tell you about that. But I'll leave that to the Q&A. Thank you very much. <laughs>